There's been a long love-hate relationship with cities. They're big and messy. In New York City or in Shanghai, it's easier to go up 300 meters than it is to travel horizontally 300 meters during much of the day. If we don't find the solutions in cities, then we're going to have a hard time finding the solutions because that's where most of people are living, and that is going to increasingly be the case. The cities emerged uh, about 10,000 years ago. The conventional wisdom is that uh, when we moved to settled agriculture 10,000 years or so ago, cities or towns, as it were, began to grow as agglomerations of population to do with the division of labor, the increasing surplus in society and so on. And, you know, for, for thousands of years, technological constraints limited the size of cities. Humans since ever in all settings, travel about 70 minutes per day, whether it's rice farmers going to their fields, students going to elementary schools, or commuters. In fact, the best definition of a city, I think, is the area that uh, you can reach in 35 minutes and then get back home again. That is to say, that from the center to the periphery, uh, that, that round trip of about 70 minutes, which is about what people are willing to travel each day, really defines an urban area. We're crossing the 50% of the world population living in cities now. Um, that is in the developed world already up to 80, 85%. And since the developed world countries are creating many of the uh, environmental problems that we're seeing globally now, that level of urbanization is something to really think about in terms of how do we have to modify our theory in order to take into account the prevalence and predominance of this one species, a human species, that inhabits urban ecosystems? China is a living laboratory of rapid urban growth. The world's most populous country got a late start on urbanization, but is catching up quickly. Today, around 45% of the population lives in cities. The sheer scale of this extreme makeover is enormous. Some 89 cities have a million people, and seven cities have more than five million people. This rapid urbanization has caused some significant problems. I'm strolling down a hutong, a rare and vanishing example of a traditional Beijing neighborhood. People here heat their homes using coal. In fact, coal consumption, coal combustion, is the predominant form of energy, electricity, and hot water heating here in Beijing. Today, the air is quite breathable, but some days, the air reeks of sulfur, and the pea soup is like London of the early 20th century. No wonder, then, that Beijing officials worry about air quality for the upcoming Summer Olympics. But really, it's the most vulnerable, the very young, the elderly, who are at risk from this very heavy pollution burden. The environmental Kuznets curve is very simple. Initially, richer is dirtier, and then later, richer is cleaner. When, first, when people first start to have higher incomes, they chew through lots of stuff, they chop down lots of trees, they burn coal, they make a, make a mess. But then when they, in turn, get a bit richer after that, cleanliness, environment, safety, those values become more important, and they have the resources to invest. So you have a kind of arc where, with rising incomes initially, life, the economy, cities become dirtier, and then later on they become cleaner. And I think what we're seeing in many societies now is uh, a very, very strong preference for a rising share of people's wealth and income to be dedicated to environmental quality. The misconception is that there is a nature out there, and then there's a society over here. And so if people are living in cities, they're not living in nature. They're not living in an ecosystem, in an ecological system. And in fact, that's not the case. Urban environments um, are ecosystems. They have living and non-living components that interact. Um, they are areas that, in which ecological processes are going on all the time. Uh, we can learn a lot from looking at urban ecosystems in the same way that we look at other ecosystems. Um, 
But what we have learned in years of study of urban ecosystems is that we can't ignore the fact that they are dominated by one species, this human species, and that we have to use the tools and approaches that have been developed in social sciences to really understand the interactions between the social system and the ecological system. If you look at city plans, they're still rather top-down, rather idealistic. They don't really relate to what cities are actually like, as it were. But our, our scientific view has begun to change, that uh, it's much more to do with the fact that this kind of messiness of cities is, um, is effectively a manifestation of a kind of underlying order, and that we need to take this into account. So that's a change that's going on at the moment. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the, uh, on, on, my, on my computer screen here, I have a picture of London, uh, which is the, the form of London, uh, something like uh, 40 miles across and 40 miles north. It's the actual picture of uh, the spread of the city, and it looks like a kind of a cancer. It looks messy, it looks angry, and that's been the predominant view of cities, I think, uh, for, from all sorts of perspectives, but, and that's the thing that's begun to change recently. So the digital world is giving this, us this ability to uh, learn more about cities. But at the same time, of course, we, we have to be conscious of the fact that uh, cities are also responding and changing to the very existence of this digital world. It's, it's kind of two-way traffic. I mean, uh, we get to know more about the city, but at the same time, cities are changing with response to these technological uh, technological developments. Now, in terms of actually thinking about cities, thinking about um, how we might go about uh, communicating these ideas to people, uh, then clearly uh, the idea of representing the city digitally is important. And again, I'm looking at this uh, movie of uh, Canary Wharf here, and you can actually see that uh, uh, this effect effectively is like a, a, a land use plan showing you the location of different land uses in the wharf. But it's also in 3D, and we can manipulate it, we can fly through it, uh, because we can put it on the web, we can actually communicate the plan to a whole range of people in a very effective way. Now, that is something which is very new, um, and in a digital world where we have the ability to, uh, to link large numbers of people to this sort of, uh, these sort of visualizations, then that's a very effective way of beginning to think about uh, uh, a kind of a planning of, of cities that uh, involves a much wider constituency of people than... Uh, we've ever had the ability to do previously. The 20th century experienced, in my view, a, a, the great misfortune of the, the development of the suburbs. Uh, I don't like the suburbs. Uh, I regard suburbanites as castrated peasants. You can't even keep a chicken in the suburbs for fear that the neighbors will complain because of the noise. Uh, so I, I hope that we'll see in the 21st century uh, a decline in that environment and again a rise of true and beautiful cities. The American writer Gertrude Stein in about the year 1930 remarked that at that time, in 1930, the United States was the oldest country in the world because the United States had been in the 20th century longer than any other country. And in 2008 I would say that cities like Hong Kong and Shanghai and Bangalore have now been in the 21st century longer than London or Paris or New York or Chicago. And so I think we really need to look to these new cities uh, for experience and models. Where will cities be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, a century from now? Expect in the near future eco-cities to arise. These cities will use renewable resources to try to reduce their carbon footprint, the ratio of the carbon they emit to the carbon that's absorbed in the city. It's heartening to imagine that humanity can summon the courage to radically rethink our concept of cities and create living spaces in harmony with nature. Before this vision can be fully realized, however, we must solve the problems, the many discouraging problems of the urban lifestyle that three billion of us have chosen to lead today. Scientists must take the lead in helping to draw up the blueprints for the sustainable cities of the future. In this special issue on cities, find news, reviews, and perspectives on urbanization, health, reproduction, traffic, pollution, water, energy, and much more.
Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.